All right, thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Sydney Newman, and I'm excited to present a little bit about ALK dependent angiogenesis in NKT cell lymphomas. All right, so let's give a little bit of an overview about what we're going to be talking about today. So AKT is going to be a protein that plays a critical intermediary role in many cellular functions. This includes metabolism, growth, proliferation, survival, transcription, and even protein synthesis. Diversity here is going to be indicated by its still critical role, but being played fairly upstream in most pathways. Now, the following presentation is going to describe its role in angiogenesis as documented in NK T cell lymphomas. This is a very rare type of lymphoma that has a particularly poor prognosis, rendering any involved pathway of susceptibility relevant for its therapeutic potential. So here we're going to attempt to understand AKT dependent pathways involved in first getting the raw material for epithelial migration, second attempting a vascular structure, and third regulating the environment under the physiologic conditions that it's inclined to. Such is going to be in an effort to comprehend the intervention points posed by the multiple involvements of AKT from its upstream position with the pathogenesis of NKTCL. So this can include points like EGFR amplification, P10 mutation, VEGF increases, PAK phosphorylation, etc. We're really painting with a broad brush here. So first thing we need to consider what actually is AKT. It's also known as protein kinase P or PKB, uh, being from a proncogene that gives a serine theranine kinase activated by multiple things, uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, integrins, B and T cell receptors, cytokine receptors, GCPRs, um, and other stimuli to give essentially sequential phosphorylations that may lead to either VEGF stimulation regulation or nitrous oxide regulation that will both impact angiogenesis. Okay, so something that's going to play an absolutely critical role here in understanding these pathogenesis is the uh, metabolic pathway itself. So what steps bring about AKT? And to do this, I really want to take a second to understand the upstream targets that can bring about AKT where their manipulation is really going to be able to manipulate the quantities that bring about my downstream activators. So first, we're going to have uh, some sort of stimulatory molecule, uh, more commonly a hormone, so EGFR. We can also have another uh, molecular stimulator known as PDGR uh, with its, you know, its receptor. Um, and what that's ultimately going to do is it's just going to stimulate what I really care about here. That's PI3K. Um, and that stimulation is going to bring about a level of phosphorylation, typically from P10 here, um, which can bring about dual phosphorylation that brings my PDK1. Um, so here again, we see multiple hormones that are potentially involved or some gene activations that can just increase its transcription translation. Um, but ultimately, what we're getting is a phosphorylation of PI3K1 which brings us PDK1. Now, a second phosphatory pathway um, is going to actually bring about AKT. Um, that can be directly from this guy, or it can be indirectly from another donor as seen here. So once we have activated EKT, my downstream activators are going to be pretty direct, involving the nitrous oxide pathway, which can increase angiogenesis, or a bit more indirectly, um, that being VEGF HIF1 alpha stimulated, or for materials uh, such as the uh, protein synthesis, glucose metabolism, cell cycle regulation, or cell survival. Um, all of this can duly be involved um, and have multiple manifestations other than angiogenesis. So we are creating vasculature here, right? We are talking about angiogenesis, and this, um, you know, vessel system arteries are intensely complicated, and there are considerations that need to be involved when doing that. The first one is going to be getting the cells, orienting them, protecting them from apoptosis, and aligning them within the body's physiology itself. All right, so I've been using a lot of acronyms. Let's discuss some of the relevant vocabulary other than AKT so we can start using them a little more vernacularly. So the first one I'd like to address is actually going to be VEGFA. This is a vascular endothelial growth factor A, 
being a heparin binding protein that exists as disulfide linked homodimers as a member of the PDGF BEGF growth factor family, essential for both physiological and pathological angiogenesis, which is why it's critical here. Now, extension of that sort of uh, stimulatory factors is going to be PDGRA, which is going to be a platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha, being a tyrosine kinase responsible for signal transduction. Now, PDGF uh, binding activates the protein to phosphorylate and induce multiple other signaling pathways, stereotypical of neoplastic cell growth, proliferation, and survival, which is why we are going to want to uh, be highly regulatory of it. Uh, now, moving on, P10. P10 is going to be a phosphatase intense and homolog, which is going to be a rising from a gene that encodes common tissue enzymes, which dimerize with another P10 enzyme, modifying other proteins and lipids by sequential dephosphorylation, acting as a tumor suppressor to regulate cell division and migration. Hence, the relationship between PDGRA and P10 is going to be ultimately uh, critically responsible for my uh, tumor regulation and suppressing um, you know, relationship. So with that in mind, moving on to the cyclic cycle between P10, PI3K, and PDK. PI3K is going to be the phosphoinoticide 3 kinase, which is a group of plasma membrane-associated lipid kinases consisting of three subunits, two regulatory and one catalytic, for key serine theranine kinase activity in signal transduction, but it's specifically serving as a docking site for proteins uh, with this pH domain, such as AKT's upstream activator, PDK1, which brings us to actual PDK1 involving that cyclic cycle of phosphorylation, dephosphorylation between P10 and PI3K, uh, goaling to bring about PDK if the goal is more a DK. So PDK is going to be uh, PI3K's bound AKT upstream activator, uh, which once bound has the ability to phosphorylate AKT at this theranine 308 site for partial activation or its serenine 473 site for full activation. So first thing I'd like to discuss in application is the biochemical basis of uh, cell migration and survival um, as it refers to regulation here and ultimately the uh, pathologic manifestation of it. Now key here will be conjugate or continued stimulation by the EGF to maintain the extracellular matrix and intracellular junction integrity, such that required growth factors can interact and actually activate AKT to maintain endothelial viability while duly blocking detachment induced apoptosis. For angiogenic purposes, integrins are gonna kind of be the vehicle for this. Um, they should bind the EGF and PDGF clustering with the actin and cytoskeleton uh, through signaling molecules for further promoting integrin clustering. It's going to activate intracellular signaling and potentiate its compounding angiogenic role, giving a feeling of a little bit of a perpetual motion machine here. Ultimately, however, migration, it's just incredibly multimodal, even when only considering AKT's role in the pathway. So AKT directly can phosphorylate S1Ps to induce RAC-activated enhancement of the endothelial differentiation gene, EDG, causing actin reorganization in that cytoskeleton, membrane ruffling, and extension of the lamiopoda. Rather, normally, that gene should typically be regulated by low-density lipoproteins to promote dephosphorylation of AKT. So it's, it's still involved, but we're seeing how the process is limited by an indirect factor there. So AKT can also drive directional migration through localizing the leading edge membrane in a P13K dependent manner. Um, alternatively, uh, from more of an indirect manner, the, the precursor PI3K is just essential components in chemotaxis and chemoattraction. Uh, where activation of AKT in macrophages uh, and neutrophils uh, can actually feedback decrease AKT um, and increase the precursor. Uh, therefore, cell migration momentarily at least will be increased. 
Now, AKT can alternatively phosphorylate PAK to regulate polarity and therefore a little bit more directly chemotaxis by inducing cytoskeletal rearrangement again. Um, of necessity, however, in later stages where the expression cannot be minimized to a threshold of relevance. Now, a great application that I'd like to expand on is continued VEGF stimulation through the PI3K AKT pathway. So endothelial maintenance is going to be achieved by this pathway. And here it's shown to increase VEGF translation as the pathway forces mammalian target of rampamycin phosphorylation. Um, transcriptional factor repressure 4E binding protein to associate the paratranslational translational factor 4E. Um, binding of that will free the translational factor, inhibition factor. Um, so it's then capable of initiating a translation if the remaining proteins, particularly the EGF, whose PDGA feedback loop is inhibited anyway, reinforcing again that perpetual motion mushy. So now let's consider the biochemical basis behind regulation of angiogenic structure. First, I want to consider the biochemical players. So who are they? The issue with neoplastic vasculature structure is that its aberrant heterogeneity is going to induce an oxygen, nutritional, and waste gradient that perpetuates each physiologic condition. Therein, we consider its regulation on the basis of how this fact gives a perpetual motion machine in the form of VEGF. So what is the AKT pathway involved? For that, I want to consider regulation of nitrous oxide signaling in endothelial cells. Now, the EGF is going to increase vasculature for permeability from a formative material availability basis. This gives a perpetual motion machine that propagates the constant supply of APK for phosphorylation to give AKT for angiogenesis. Here, AKT can phosphorylate any of the enos isoforms at the serine 1177 residue to give nitrous oxide as an angiogenic material precursor. Alternatively, in extremely hypoxic scenarios, because there's always backup plans in place, HSP90 phosphorylation of the enos uh, residues can induce the PI3K AKT pathway to give more AKT as the better phosphorus donor giving again the same angiogenic nitrous oxide precursors. Um, so a little bit of this feeling that there are backup plans in place that still are going to prefer activation of the AKT pathway for availability of angiogenic precursors. So now let's discuss the biochemical basis behind structure maintenance allowed by blood pressure. First, let's consider the biochemical players. The aforementioned perpetual motion machine will particularly give the EGF in proportion to the partial pressure of O2 seen intravascularly. With consideration that physiologic conditions respond to extremes, the hypoxia hypercarbia will stimulate a physiologic response to that environment atop new neoplastic alterations whose gradients compounded and brought about the environmental extremity. In this case, sympathetic st stimulation to hypercarbia induces peripheral vasodilation, which is consistent with the minimal vasomotor tone expected during neoangiogenesis. Still, there is a melobotic pathway to ensure lower blood pressure for supply and waste demands that its own heterogenic structure depresses. Now, what is the AKT pathway involved? And to that, I'd like to reference a hypoxia-induced multi-step pathway that simply involves AKT. Here, hypoxia-inducible factor 1 increases instability with decreasing PaO2 by post-translational modification of the alpha subunit, which is available to combine the consistently present beta subunits. The resultant heterodimer can then bind hypo hypoxia response elements on promoters to begin transcription of more VEGF, necessitating the simple AKT precursor to bring about HIF-alpha. So there are multiple ways to diagnose NKTCO. I'd like to first discuss the most obvious, that being by clinical signs. Initial presentation is probably going to be a neutropenia giving generalized arthritic joint pain, probably most notable on a physiologic basis in the sacroiliac joint. Um, and it is going to progress into a broad leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, through which at this point in time, antibody studies are actually gonna be negative. Uh, now, as things become positive, that would be positive for NKT markers, 
um, on IHC, what we're going to probably be seeing in association is modest facial lesions atop a splenomegaly diagnosed on ultrasonography, uh, but no lymphadenopathy and no hepatomegaly. So next, we're going to be seeing a generalized hypocellularity of these NK cells described as pleomorphic lymphoid on cytology. That's going to be their plasmacytoid appearance with cleaving nuclei, a paranuclear zone, multiple nucleoli, and basophilic activation. Luckily, to some degree, uh, we're still responsive to chopped chemotherapy at this point in time. When we start to see issues is as that hypocellularity progresses into a uh, pancytopenia despite the chemotherapy. Here we're probably seeing hepatosplenomegaly and skin lesion ulceration now spreading across to the gums, palate, nose, and eyes. Ultimate death is likely by a sequela or complication such as failure to recover from anesthesia uh, due to liver damage, um, lobular pneumonia despite high dose steroids. Um, unfortunately, it's, uh, it, it probably won't be pretty. So let's talk about diagnosing by immunohistochemistry first. So IHG is going to be a tissue immunolabeling method that attempts to give an immunophenotype based on a series of stained samples by biopsy. So NKTCL is going to be given a definitive clinical entity by testing positive for CD3 to 56, TIA1, granzyme B, and markers for the Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, now, negative, uh, or things we rather shouldn't be seeing, a positive uh, color change for is going to be CD4, 8, 5, and 7. Uh, this means that we tested positive for an NK cell marker um, and positive for the general uh, T uh, leukocyte marker, um, but negative for more specific lineages of the T sites. <clears throat> So ALK is going to be involved in its, in its phosphorylated intranuclear form that can actually pick up state. Um, it's actually something that we can see, and it will reflect an active downstream reaction taking place, um, but it is unfortunately of unknown intention due to its particularly upstream nature, but it does directly suggest more cytoplasmic fluidity at that point in time. So let's discuss some more advanced methods for diagnosing, in this case, gene mapping. So genes present or amplified relating to ALK should include EGFR amplification. They're in increasing PI3K, PDK, and they're in AKT, thereby angiogenesis. Secondly, we can have amplification of VEGFA, which should again increase PI3K, PDK, and AKT. We can also get um, increase of my PDGRA and its phosphorylated receptor form, leading to increased binding availability of PDGF and therefore more phosphorylation ability of PI3K relating to my P10 version, therefore increasing PDK and activated ADK to phosphorylate again later, again in that vicious um, cycle. So genes deleted or downregulated and their purposes within ALK pathways will include P10 mutation, uh, where blocking maintenance level AKT activation by halting apoptosis from the P10-dependent cell cycle arrest will essentially invalidate any feedback of inhibition, um, leading me to, again, that vicious perpetual motion machine. So now let's discuss where the field is going, current research, what it's involved with, um, and how it applies to an AKT cycle. So first one I'd like to discuss is of the three classes of PI3Ks, class one and two have multiple subclasses, um, but the third class doesn't even have subclasses. It consists of a single member encoded by a gene known as VPS34. Um, and I just firmly believe that there must be more and therefore more targets that we can address. Also something that's not really addressed is the cause of PDGFRA deregulation by NKTCLs, um, it's not determined. And I think that pathway or relationship can absolutely be manipulated from a therapeutic standpoint. 
Next, further characterization of the pathway constitu constituents is absolutely essential. Um, now, several of the downstream targets of AKT are recognized, right? They can have apoptotic regulatory molecules like BAD, FKHR, um, head transcription factors like IKK. However, other downstream effectors are involved in different aspects of cellular regulation, and that makes focalization difficult to predict. Herein, making manifestation of a specific mutation difficult to predict, where prognostic evaluations are not totally um, accurate or definitive. Uh, next, the effects of mutation on P10 are not distinguished from the deletion of P10, where again, from a prognostic point of view, there isn't much determination. So finally, let's consider further therapeutic methods and diagnostics. To first address the therapeutic side of that, combination therapy. It's ultimately the wave of the past, you know, um, the knowledge of the benefits of using a multimodal approach against neoplasms. Uh, is known to both decrease the dosages and the side effects of each constituent. Um, and it's something that's really not being used at the moment with great variety. Um, and that is really a failure of us to apply the learning and education that we are increasingly uh, learning about NKT cell lymphomas and the pathways of susceptibility involved. So current research is going to have method including MTORC1 and TORC2 inhibitors, OC27 and OXA1. Um, and these have been shown to considerably reduce angiogenesis and regrowth compared to rampamycin alone by terminating our very special AKT P10 dependent feedback loop. Um, however, that is about where um, that's about where it ends. So next, let's talk about the diagnostics involved, where the need for diagnostics across species to test for therapeutics across species um, is still very much in the process. Um, so in 2019, the antibody marker for human CD56, um, the diagnostic marker for human NK cells, was shown to be cross-reactive by Western blot with feline receptors. Um, and that is allowing emerging therapies to be considered. However, that... Uh, such cross-reactivity has yet to be established across certain other relevant species, such as dogs. Um, so the growth of the canine uh, therapeutic response to NKT cell lymphomas can absolutely be further advanced by giving a definitive diagnosis of NKT cell lymphoma, where currently we can only say a null. And here I've got seven beautiful references that definitely helped me with understanding uh, the processes involved in AKT pathways alongside NKT cell lymphomas. Um, so thank you to all of these individuals. And lastly, here, I'd like to thank all of the individuals uh, who aided in providing the images responsible for um, helping me, at least. And I do hope you understand the pathways and pathologies involved in AKT-dependent NK-T cell lymphoma.